Carolina church. Roof says he has no plans to call witness of his own. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Courtney Collins. This is Bloomberg. I'm Caroline Hyde. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, fangs get their bite back. As the Dow flirts at 20,000, we look at how tech stocks help drive indices to new record highs. Plus, Putin himself ordered a campaign to influence the US election. We dig into the newly issued intelligence report as Donald Trump aims to aggressively combat cyber attacks. And a more personal touch for fitness trackers. We are live at CES with Fitbit CEO James Park and his plan to jumpstart the wearables market. But first, to our lead. A positive read on wages drives US stocks higher as the Dow flirts with a key 20,000 threshold. Average hourly earnings jumped nearly 3% over the last 12 months, the most since the end of the last recession back in June 2009. Well, that helped push the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 to record highs in Friday trading, with the tech sector leading the way. Check out my chart. I'm in the IMAP when you come to the stock 600. What's leading the charge? What's the brighter green? It's the IT, up almost one percentage point, which you're looking at this particular sector. The so-called fang stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Google, all in fact rallying more than 4% this week. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg stock reporter Oliver Rennick from New York. Oliver, close but no cigar when it comes to the Dow, but overall it was a strong day for tech. Story of my life, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, the Dow once again going back and forth around 20,000. Uh, as we saw today, it really popped around 1230, got to the level, and then just kind of sat there for about three and a half hours before falling off a little bit. Uh, but as you pointed out, the story overall for the market, even though the Dow 20,000 is mostly just symbolic, uh, the story for the market is, as you point out, uh, in large degree thanks to some of the tech stocks coming back. I mean, uh, as you saw right there on the IMAP, anytime you have financial uh, and tech stocks rallying together, we also have strength in real estate, but really when you have those tech stocks that are so big, I mean, that obviously helps lift the market when you have gains of upwards of 4% there. I mean, you're looking at Fang right there uh, when you're looking at Amazon for the A. Uh, if you also look at Apple, they did pretty well too. They're up 2%, obviously massive companies all across the board. So uh, the fact that these are now back also kind of goes in line with the idea that we have seen investors favor some of the higher beta stocks, the ones that move uh, with bigger swings relative to the market, which is what you see in a lot of those uh, NASDAQ stocks. Yeah, Apple helping the Dow, Lumina, eBay, TripAdvisor all yep. helping on the S&P 500. When you're talking to the analysts as you've been anchoring earlier today, give us a sense of whether they think this is going to last. Are we ever going to get past that <laughs> symbolic number on the Dow in particular? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed batch, you know. I think some of the technical people take it a little bit more seriously than others. We spoke with Tom DeMarc earlier, and he basically said that he thinks we're kind of burning out around this level, that the people that have already assumed the Dow's going to break it are buying, so you might have trouble getting more buyers in to take it over that. Uh, he said if we fall short of it, that's not going to be a good thing. Market could go down further. He says if we cross it, it'll go up higher. Uh, so the technical people that rely on those sort of signals do take it a little bit to heart a little bit more, so I don't want to dismiss it too much. Um, but at the same time, you have mostly sort of the fundamental people that say, hey, look, nothing has really changed, right? Uh, if you look at all the math behind anything that you would calculate based for, you know, based on your assumption where the market's going to go, it doesn't change. Uh, multiples are basically where they were uh, a week ago. And, you know, obviously, as we continue to move upwards, all those sort of multiples, earnings, all that stuff kind of comes into question because people want to know uh, and try and figure out, suss out whether or not the market is getting toppy, if it's getting towards highs. Yeah. Um, but again, this is another week that adds to the post-Trump rally. So we'll see where it goes. And dollar popping back a bit. How much does this affect some of the big tech heavyweights, of course, a lot of them international companies? Yeah. The dollar being strong doesn't always help. It doesn't. Uh, and that's going to be an important uh, point to watch because really over the course of the past year or so, we had a big drought in earnings. They didn't really go anywhere for almost six quarters. And a lot of that was due to sort of strengthening dollar. Now, obviously, dollar is moving even higher. The question is whether or not we're going to see sort of the trade weighted dollar uh, move a little bit higher as well. You look relative to history, there's still plenty of room to 
go here. And ultimately, it's going to be an interesting question of whether or not a higher dollar and higher rates can sort of offset what's going to happen if we do indeed have this sort of push towards government spending, fiscal spending, whether or not that puts a bottom line uh, assistance to companies that then might say, hey, let's go out and you know spend some money on CapEx, let's build some plants, let's hire yeah. people. But then again, we saw economic data today, you know, the uh, jobless rate and unemployment is pretty low already. Who knows how you know far we'll be able to push that in. It's always great to talk to you, Oliver Rennick. We wish you a great weekend. Thanks for being across all of these numbers from Bloomberg News. Now, turning to cybersecurity, the U.S. government released a declassified intelligence report on Russian hacking in the U.S. presidential election. The intelligence community found Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered to influence and help President-elect Donald Trump win the campaign by discrediting Secretary Clinton. This release comes out shortly after top officials briefed President-elect Donald Trump earlier today. In a statement, Trump called the meeting with the heads of the FBI, CIA and national intelligence, quote, constructive. And the president-elect also announced his plans to appoint a team to give recommendations on preventing and combating cyber attacks on government and private computer networks. Joining us now to break this all down, Bloomberg News reporter Chris Strom from Washington. Chris, when it comes to Trump, we know that the intelligence agencies went into Trump Tower. Do we know whether he's really changed his opinion on whether Russia was behind this or not? According to the statement that we got from Trump so far, he hasn't commented on whether he's changed his, his mind. Uh, what he said is that uh, he has great respect for the intelligence agencies and that it's clear that multiple countries, including Russia, have tried to hack into uh, U.S. institutions. And so he, he's not conceding at this point the, 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 the extent of which the hacking operation was done to discredit Hillary Clinton and help his campaign. Um, but at the same time, he's kind of walking back from the edge of where he was. I mean, these are sensational statements coming from this report, saying that Vladimir Putin himself gave the order. It's a busy time for these intelligence agencies. They're going up in front of the Senate. Are we going to hear any more detail? Uh, yeah, I think we will hear some more details. The intelligence chiefs are going to testify next week before the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, they testified yesterday before the uh, before another Senate committee. But at that point, this declassified report wasn't out. But now this declassified report is out. There's more material in which to uh, dig into, and I think you'll see. Uh, you know, the testimony uh, delve into some of these further details. And for the first time, I mean, really significant that the U.S. intelligence community uh, is, is naming uh, Vladimir Putin as, as carrying out an influence campaign in order to meddle in the U.S. elections, that he ordered a campaign. And part of that was a hacking operation in order to benefit Donald Trump. It did seem as though there was potentially an olive branch being given from Donald Trump, the president-elect, to the intelligence com committee chiefs. He seemed to be saying that it was constructive and pushing forward the need for cybersecurity. Is that something you felt on the ground in Washington? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, that from Trump's point of view and from, from uh, the team around him, they feel it's untenable to continue a, uh, a, a, to, to have such a negative relationship with the intelligence community. Remember, Trump is going to be depending on the intelligence community to bolster arguments and policies that he wants to advance. And so he cannot continue to discredit the intelligence agencies and then turn around and try to use them to defend some of the policies that he wants to advance. And so I think that what we saw today is Trump starting to walk back from the, uh, from the, the extreme criticism that he was leveling against U.S. intelligence. Perhaps not walking back from his anger that he sometimes shows to the media agencies and seems to be wanting some sort of investigation to do with NBC getting the leaked report before he did. Can you explain a little bit about what we might see there? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, Trump uh, will send out uh, uh, tweets on all kinds of different subjects. And today he sent out one saying that there should be a congressional investigation into uh, how NBC obtained, uh, uh, you know, information about the... Um, intelligence report before he got briefed on it. Um, I mean, this is kind of, you know, what we've seen Trump do is that uh, when he's presented with facts that don't really support what he believes or, or what he wants other people to believe, he tries to muddy the waters and, and raise kind of tangential issues. And I think really what this is is kind of a, uh, a, a, an issue on the side where, you know, he wants to talk about, you know, some news media leaks when really the, the, the weight and force of, of what happened today is the actual intelligence report on Russian hacking. 
politicians deflecting. Who'd have thought it? Chris Strom of Bloomberg News. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Now, a story we are watching. AT&T and Time Warner say there may be an easier route to take to make their merger happen faster. Well, the companies say they can avoid subjecting their $85 billion deal to scrutiny by the Federal Communications Commission by not transferring any of Time Warner's FCC licenses. Well, meanwhile, the Justice Department has asked AT&T for more materials to conduct an in-depth review of the proposed deal, a sign that, well, possible regulatory approval will not happen quickly. Still to come, Microsoft is among the tech titans looking to stake a claim in the car software market. We head to CES to speak with an executive making the case for Microsoft next. This is Bloomberg. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. Now to a story we're watching. The troubled blood testing startup Theranos announcing another major round of job cuts, totaling 41% of its workforce. The company says it will eliminate 155 positions, paring down to focus on a new product, a top table blood testing product called the Minilab. Now this latest announcement comes after an earlier round of layoffs in October, in which the company also closed a number of clinical labs and consumer outlets. Now over the past year, Theranos has been plagued by regulatory setbacks, lawsuits, and public scrutiny. Now back to the biggest tech trade show of the year, CES. Like many other tech giants on the ground in Las Vegas this week, Microsoft is pushing to be a leader in car software and just recently signed a deal with Renault Nissan in September. Microsoft's head of business development, Peggy Johnson, spoke to us about the company's plan to get behind the wheel. Today we're announcing Microsoft's connected vehicle platform. And basically it's a set of cloud-based tools that are gonna empower the automakers to develop their own differentiated in-car connected experiences. Um, and by 2020, something like 90% of all of the vehicles on the road are gonna be connected. So it's a great opportunity to work with them. Do you feel by 2020 they'll be automated driving on the road? Will it all be driverless cars by then? No, by 2020, 90% of all the vehicles on the road will be connected. 
So this presents a great opportunity for us to work with the automakers as they create their own customized in-car experiences. How is the division of data occurring between Microsoft and the auto companies? Because some of these car makers have been very wary of Apple, of Google owning the data in the car. What sort of agreements do you have in place? Well, from our perspective, we, um, we are not going to be building our own autonomous self-driving car, uh, but we are in the business of producing software that we believe will help enable the car companies to reach their goals and their ambitions in this space. And clearly there's a lot of new entrants in there and many of them have turned to us as a partner. We won't be competing with them on that front and we have the tools that they can use to really engage with some of these complex new technologies that um, they're dealing with as they go through their digital transformation. So things like artificial intelligence. So we can combine uh, data that we have with data that they have and reason across the whole body of data to come up with new customer insights that will, we think, bring some pretty exciting new opportunities for the consumer uh, to utilize the time they spend in their vehicles, which for many of us uh, who have long commutes, that time we can use to perhaps be more productive in the future as we move toward the world where we're headed, where we're fully autonomous driving. And anywhere along that spectrum, we want to be there to give the car manufacturers the tools to produce those experiences. Who do you see as your key competitors in the space? Well, really, we don't see um, any individual as uh, having the same breadth and depth of assets that we have in this space. So we have things like uh, productivity that we can bring together with our personal assistant, together with our deep knowledge of artificial intelligence field, and combining that all through a connected fashion um, using our vehicle, our new connected vehicle platform. So we feel very good about our position here, and we feel we're uniquely positioned to help the automakers reach their goals. That was Microsoft Business Development Chief Peggy Johnson. Staying with CES, there's plenty of innovation on display that will drive the top tech trends of 2017. Things like driverless car tech and virtual assistants. But there's also plenty of gadgets that will be a bit harder to catch on. Throughout the hour, Bloomberg Technologies' Alex Webb will give us a taste of the weird and the wacky side of CES. So the latest Star Wars film, Rogue One, was all about working out how to destroy the Death Star. But Melbourne, Australia-based Plox wants the Death Star to be an ever-present in your life. They've come out with this speaker. It's the Star Wars Death Star speaker. Floats over the uh, magnet of the uh, base, and it retails about $170 in the US. Fill a small room with sound, it will. Now, another company we've been watching this week, Samsung Electronics, showed its resilience after its Galaxy Note 7 fiasco, after it reported its best operating profit in three years. Check out my chart. You can see it on G hashtag BTV153 if you want to tune in and see it for yourself. Here I've placed the sales year on year, and you'll see in this just preliminary numbers for this quarter, Sales, lackluster, will down by almost one percentage point. But check out the operating profit. We are seeing operating income year on year suddenly spike up almost 50%. Who would have thought it when we've seen such agonization over what happened to the combustible Galaxy Note 7? We've seen it, the most profitable gadget be hit so hard in its previous quarter. Biggest corporate crisis, you could call it, for Samsung. Well, this, to me, does not speak of a big corporate crisis. Why? chips. Remember, Samsung doesn't only do well when its own mobiles sell well, but also when rivals sell well. Think of the cheaper competitors in China. Suddenly, the desire to get hold of its own chips are driving up the prices, so its semiconductor unit did particularly well, as did light-emitting diode screens that they provide for their competitors as well. Lick of paint on some of their older products also helped make up for the shortfall in the Galaxy Note 7. So, notable chart. Go and have a little look for yourself. But coming up, we'll review the week that was at CES. What were the gadgets and the gizmos that had everyone talking? More in today's Tech Wrap next. This is Bloomberg.
Now let's head back to the annual tech spectacle that is the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Earlier I sat down with Bloomberg Technology Executive Editor Tom Giles and reporter Alex Webb on the ground in CES to go through the themes that dominated this year's event. The 2017 show, it turns out, was more about the connected car than anything else. Take a listen. I think this has been the trend over the past couple of years. It's really become a, a car show. Um, I think increasingly, though, what we're seeing is the merging of these different industries. And in, the big theme this year has been artificial intelligence, and the, but the way that is being brought into the home, into the car, and what people are able to do with it. Alex, it's a great point. And Tom, we saw Microsoft really fighting to own the, the voice assistant space within the car and launching Cortana across the Nissan. But this has really been a fierce fight. We've seen Alexa dominate over the festive period with Amazon, but everyone wants in when it comes to personal assistance. Yeah, I mean, the thinking is that these are going to be everywhere. This is going to be the we. This is going to be the way that we interact with, uh, with with marketers. This is going to be the way we interact with our light switches, our refrigerators. They really do want to make this the hub of our home and do the kinds of things that people have been wanting to do with artificial intelligence for many, many years. You know, we've, 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 there's been this hope for it, and now we've finally got the, the actual gadgets to go behind it. And Alexa's taken a really, really big lead, as we talked about earlier in the week. You know, and they've been uh, ubiquitous at CES yeah. from, from what everybody is, from what everybody's told me and what I've read about. Um, but, but now can the, can Google's home? you know can they make inroads Mark Zuckerberg as we talked about he put together his own his own assistant with Morgan Friedman's voice so you're gonna see more and more of that and I think it's gonna take up more and more space at CES in the coming years Alex who wasn't there when it comes to AI because many feeling that perhaps Apple's dropped the ball here well, I mean, Apple never comes to CES. It's not really a place to launch products. You get a lot more attention. Certainly, Apple does doing it on, you know, on the couple of months either side of the show. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that Apple isn't here in some capacity having meetings in hotel rooms. But yeah, the question has been a lot about Apple's um, advances here in the AI space. You know, Siri was the first out of the gate. Since then, has somewhat stagnated. Apple's done some move, has made some movements in recent months. It hired a guy from Carnegie Mellon, uh, Russ Alakudinov. He's a big name in the AI space. I spoke to a few people here who know him and they yeah. say he's a really impressive operator. Um, so you know, there's hope that maybe Apple accelerates a little bit, but they are, they've got ground to regain, essentially. That was Bloomberg's Alex Webb and Tom Giles. Now, besides covering the serious stuff, well, Alex has also been hard at work seeking out the wackiest gadgets of CES. Here's another look. This is the litter robot from Auto Pets in Auburn Hills, Michigan. What happens is your cat hops in, does his business. The robot detects its weight and seven minutes later quietly rotates, whips away the garbage and replaces it with new cat litter. To be able to get one, all you need is $449 in your kitty. The utopia of technology, I'm sure. Coming up, 2016 was tough for Fitbit, but the wearables maker is looking to pick up the pace. CEO James Park shares his latest plan to hook consumers with new features next. And coming up this Monday on Bloomberg Television, EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestager will join my colleague David Gura for an exclusive interview. Tune into that conversation at 10.30 a.m. New York time, 3.30 p.m. in London. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on Bloomberg Radio at Bloomberg.com and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
I'm Courtney Collins and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. Florida Governor Rick Scott says the citizens of Florida will not tolerate senseless acts of evil. He spoke today after getting briefed on, his, on today's deadly shooting at Fort Lauderdale Airport. Scott says he spoke to the president-elect and vice president-elect who promised to provide necessary resources. Meanwhile, a Fort Lauderdale official says the suspect was a passenger on a Canadian flight with a gun in a checked bag. They also believe he loaded the weapon in a bathroom. Five people were killed and at least eight wounded. A U.S. senator says the suspect had a military ID with the name Esteban Santiago. Meanwhile, Florida police say he has been taken into custody alive. We have uh, the shooter in custody. Uh, he's uh, unharmed. No law enforcement fired any shots. The subject is being interviewed by a team of FBI agents and Broward Sheriff's Office homicide detectives. The U.S. intelligence community released its unclassified report on Russia and the election cyber breach. The report concludes Russia's Vladimir Putin, quote, ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. It goes on to say Putin and the Russian government aspired to help President-elect Trump's election chances when possible by discrediting Secretary Clinton and publicly contrasting her unfavorably to him. All three agencies agree on the assessment. President Obama has renewed his campaign to keep the Affordable Care Act in place. In an interview with news website Vox, he was critical of the GOP plan to repeal Obamacare and then replace it. The strategy of repeal first and replace later uh, is just a huge disservice to the American people and is something that uh, I think, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you should be opposed to. The president says if Republicans can make Obamacare better, he's all for it. French presidential candidate Marine Le Pen says the UK economy is weathering Brexit and thinks France should take the leap next. The far-right National Front candidate says if she's elected, she will immediately put that to a national referendum. Scotland's first minister is willing to... Nicola Sturgeon says that in exchange, she wants a compromise deal on the European Union. That keeps Scotland in the single market. Last June, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to stay in the bloc. And the Obamas are throwing an A-list party tonight in what could be their last big bash before they leave the White House. Spokesman, spokesman Josh Ernest confirmed the party. No word yet on an official guest. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Courtney Collins. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. We're heading back to CES in Las Vegas, where the wearable Pioneer Fitbit has rolled out new features for the new year. The make of the fitness tracker had a, well, a tough 2016, to say the least, with a 75% collapse in its share price. But it's looking to bounce back by adding new social features, upgrading its personal trainer app, and offering financial incentives for meeting fitness goals. But will it be enough to convince consumers that the wearable is a must-have item in an increasingly crowded market? Joining us now from CES in Las Vegas is Fitbit CEO James Park. With me in the studio is Bloomberg editor-at-large Corey Johnson. James, wonderful to have you join us. And let's dig into the financial incentives to keeping fit. You're sealing a deal with United Health Care and Qualcomm. Are you speaking to other insurers? How wide will this go? Uh, it's a pretty big deal for the whole industry. I mean, everyone's talked about when insurance players will connect with wearable companies and provide incentives. And this is the first real integration that proves that out. United Healthcare is going to uh, provide uh, up to $1,500 in incentives for people to reach physical activity goals uh, using their Fitbit Charge 2. And I think this is going to be the first of uh, many deals of this type in this industry. And it's a real indication that wearable health technology can drive real healthcare outcomes and lower healthcare costs. And the moment corporate wellness plans made up about less than 10% of your overall revenue. Can you give us a name of the next year, five years, how much corporate wellness plans and these insurance deals will make up in terms of revenue for Fitbit? Uh, it is less than 10% of our revenue today, but it's an area of, the, uh, area of the business that we're highly focused on. And I think, you know, we're expanding from employers, uh, of which we have 70 of the Fortune 500 today, to now working with insurance companies. So it's demonstrating that we're continuing to diversify our revenue streams. 
Yeah, I wonder, James, as, as you explore this further, uh, these corporate partnerships, do you see the usage case differ? Do the, are the people who are using Fitbits there use them for longer periods of time, less attrition of a user? Um, I think the initial data is starting to see that. I mean, United Healthcare has done a lot of internal research before rolling out this program in a broader way. And these financial incentives, I mean, $1,500, you can earn up to $4 a day. This is a pretty powerful incentive, and I think it's going to be an important tool in keeping uh, people engaged and retained uh, on this program. I also want to wonder what it means for sort of product design. Do your product design goals differ and maybe go more towards uh, wellness and less towards running, for example, uh, as you de design products for that marketplace going forward? Yeah, I think some of the features might shift, and actually we had to def uh, develop some custom functionality for United Healthcare to, to be part of this integration. And we actually, in conjunction with them, uh, uh, developed some algorithms for a device that measure things like frequency, intensity, and tenacity of the physical activity of the user. So yes, there's going to be different metrics that are going to be relevant for this insurance market. You talked how this is an industry-wide move. In the UK, I've already seen Apple do this with their smartwatches and Vitality, the healthcare provider over there. Who is the key competition? Because we're seeing smartwatches from Samsung and Apple get cheaper, the battery's getting longer. They're trying to tackle some of their headwinds. How much of the pie can you keep as Fitbit? Yeah, so I'll challenge the notion that our competitors are getting better on the hardware. I mean, I think we still have to see smartwatches that achieve more than one day battery life. Um, a lot of the smartwatches today are still hobbled by the fact that they're confined to a single ecosystem, whether it's iOS or Android. I mean, the reason that we have such a leadership position, we're number one in almost every country that we're selling in, is the fact that we're cross-platform, we're a focused brand on health and fitness, and we have a demonstrated history of working with commercial partners, employers, and now insurance companies to roll out these solutions. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the last time I went to CES, and I'm, I'm sorry that you're there, and I'm, so, I'm glad I'm not this year, but, but it, uh, last year it was so much the show about the wearables and all these competitors coming up with wearable devices, everyone from, you know, Jawbone, who you guys have been engaged in a lot of litigation over, to, uh, to Under Armour and hundreds of others, and yet your market share remains strong. What is it you think that is helping you maintain that market share? Yeah, so there's a lot of players that are falling out. I mean, you're starting to see some consolidation in the industry. Um, for instance, we were also able to pick up a lot of the software assets of Pebble, who was an early pioneer in the category. Um, I think what's uh, helped us remain a leader is, you know, the brand Fitbit really stands for health and fitness. We've built a lot of loyalty over the years. Again, the fact that we're cross-platform, we have a broad uh, selection of products with different price points, form factors, long battery life, et cetera. We have a huge community of users. We've shipped over 50 million devices, and that user community has built a tremendous competitive mode for us over the years. Are you going to have to spend more? Is there going to be more acquisitions? Um, you know, M&A is definitely an important part of our strategy to remain competitive. But we're pretty selective in the type of deals that we see. I mean, because of our leadership position, we, we see pretty much every M&A opportunity in the category. Uh, but we've been pretty selective. We've only acquired three companies so far. Um, but it's going to be an important tool for us. You have spent, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in suing Jawbone, uh, tens of millions of dollars in these suits. How much longer do you expect that to go on? And, and when will those amounts be capped? Yeah, I can't talk too much about ongoing litigation. I mean, our preference is to compete and win in the marketplace, and I think our numbers clearly show that. We're number one uh, in, again, almost every country that we're competing in. And what about the software part of the puzzle? I'm intrigued by this deal that you have with United Healthcare and Qualcomm, because at the moment you're the hardware factor. How much will you be able to boost revenue when it comes to software, when it comes to the app element of it all? So a big focus of CES for Fitbit this year was the software. We didn't launch any hardware this year. And that's really to signify the fact that we're more than a device company. We're a software and solutions company. And I think the things that we launch at CES, including uh, community feed feature, integration with third parties such as Peloton, uh, VR bicycles, uh, et cetera, this software integration deal with United Healthcare, I think demonstrates the fact that our commitment to software is going to be one of the key differentiating factors in us maintaining leadership uh, in this category. And, and we're pretty excited about it. Partnerships are the way forward, it seems. Fitbit CEO James Park and, of course, Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. Great to have you both with me.
As we wrap up the week that was at CES, Bloomberg Technologies Alex Webb has been showing us some of the best gadgets you never thought you'd need. Check out this AI powered bath time toy. This is Edwin the Duck. It is created by Pi Labs in Carmel, Indiana. They say it's the world's first educational rubber ducky. It interacts with an iPad to try to teach kids about shapes, music, stories, and they're trying to prove that it's not a load of quack. Maybe you need it. Who knew? Coming up, Apple's top executives got pay cuts last year. Meanwhile, CEO Tim Cook only had his biggest payday yet. We'll explain how the compensation racks up at the tech giant next. There were new details on the pay packages for one of the biggest CEOs in tech. Apple's Tim Cook took home roughly $145 million in 2016. As you can see here, well, it's a big jump from 2016, almost double. Anders Merlin covers executive compensation for Bloomberg News and joins me from New York on the breakdown of the numbers. Anders, talk us through it, how they're actually dividing this up, because this isn't this year completely, is it? It got a bump from what was promised back in 2011. Yeah, that's right. For Cook, so salary and bonus he, he gets for his performance this year. Now, the stock award comes from the equity comes from a stock award that he received back in 2011 when he was initially hired as CEO. Part of it is tied to Apple's stock price performance and, and dividends paid out, and part of it is just paid um, if, he, if he remains on the job. And it was a big chunk of this award that vested uh, last year, worth about $136 million in total. And when you're looking at the chart, you know, almost doubling the stock price since he's taken over, you can potentially argue why this happens. You've got to dig into the Bloomberg a little bit more. I've got Paygo, which is a function that all the Bloomberg terminal users can use. You can see that, well, Timothy Donald Cook came in 12th back in 2015 when it comes to who are the wealthiest, well, most highly compensated CEOs. But if he gets 145 million, well, suddenly that will parachute him up to what would have been fourth position this time last year. So clearly come in just shy of Sundar Pichai over at Google and still just ahead of Elon Musk. Big pay packages for the tech giants. But what about the 350 million he's now earned? What about next to come? Does he get even more uptick when it comes to 2017, 2018? 
if he stays on the job and if Apple shares keep doing well, then there's definitely more money to be to be uh, collected for him. He's gotten about three hundred and fifty million dollars worth of shares since he took over as CEO, and it's been it's half we clocked half time in in August, so he's got a, the second half of these shares left to be earned over the next five years. So there's definitely more money for him to be made, and and there could be some more big payouts in in years to come if Apple keeps doing well. More money for Tim Cook, not for his top lieutenants. You're thinking of Angela Arendt, I'm thinking of Eddie Q. They saw their money actually go down in 2016. Yeah, well, it depends on if you consider $22.8 million a lot of money or not. Um, their pay definitely <laughs> dropped. Just a smidgen. A, yeah, <laughs> their pay definitely dropped a little bit. Uh, salary stayed, stayed uh, the same, and so did the equity awards at about $20 million. What did press them down a little bit was the cash bonus. Apple missed net sales and operating income targets for fiscal 2016. 16, and that's why they saw downward adjustments. And Apple tries to link pay to performance very closely, so they do quite drastic adjustments to bonuses, even though the, the misses in, in the goals for net, net sales and operating income are actually not that great. And now, Anders, the compensation disclosures didn't include everyone, and many argue that, in fact, Johnny Ive is the most important employee over at Apple. Where did he come in? Why was his numbers not published? Yes, there's, uh, there's a bunch of legal reasons why uh, his pay doesn't have to be disclosed. Uh, he's essentially not classified as a reporting officer for, for Securities and Exchange Commission reporting purposes. So Apple doesn't have to disclose how much he makes. Um, and, you know, covering executive pay, that's something I've been curious about for a while because he is a very uh, important employee there. He's been part of developing you know, the iPhone, uh, the Macintosh, the iMac, um, a lot of important things. So we assume that he probably gets a good chunk of change as well. We just <laughs> don't know how much it is, and, and uh, uh, Apple doesn't have to disclose it. Imagination wonders. Anders Merlin with Bloomberg News. Great to have you across the story. Thank you. And from one Silicon Valley CEO to another, Tesla Motors CEO Elon Musk met with aides to President-elect Donald Trump in New York City this today, Friday. A Trump transition official says Musk met with Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and two aides to discuss economic matters related to job creation. Coming up, we continue our CES coverage with iHeart Media Chairman and CEO Bob Pittman next. This is Bloomberg.
taking you back to our CES coverage. It's hard to think of a company in radio that is working harder to remake itself than iHeartMedia. This week in Las Vegas, the company announced two new subscription services, iHeartRadio Plus and iHeartRadio All Access, powered by Napster. This comes as the country's largest radio operator is buckling under $21 billion in debt and struggling to stave off bankruptcy. Earlier, Bloomberg's Scarlett Thu spoke with iHeartMedia chairman and CEO Bob Pittman on his plans to fend off competition. iHeartRadio, um, with the all access uh, that we're doing with Napster and the Plus, um, gives us a really a, a unique position because Spotify, Apple Music, all the other subscription services, the ancestors, the LP, are, are the CD. They're really a music collection. For us, we're doing exactly the opposite. We're coming from the radio side of things. 70% of Spotify users discover their new music on FM radio. So for us, where people discover the new music is where they want to add it to the music collection. In the old days, you have to remember you want to add that song to your playlist. And with our service, you just push add and you've got it on a playlist. Or you push replay and you can play the song again on good old radio, you know, over the air FM radio, which is where the vast majority of people uh, listen to the radio. Mm. So for us, it's this interesting way to make radio interactive and to connect it to the music collection. I like the way you talked about there being ancestors, the LPs and the CDs. Uh, I wonder, though, how meaningful is on-demand service? Is it a primary driver for the changing method of delivery for, for radio content? No. Uh, radio content is, at the end of the day, companionship. 25% of our radio stations don't play any music. Uh, they're talk, news, sports, etc. cetera. So uh, it, is a, it is yet one more benefit you have, and we're doing one more thing. But when you think about it, we have events, we have social, uh, we have the free iHeartRadio service, which is fabulous as it is. Uh, but now you can make radio interactive and come alive, and you can take that music collection and put it right with your radio, as opposed to there being two separate pieces unconnected. Are streaming or on-demand services at a point where they're a strong driver of revenue and can contribute to, to profitability? Well, look, I think they're going to be a, a contributor to revenue at a certain point. Remember, we've got a lot of revenue. Uh, we're uh, over 200 million users every month. We're one of three companies, Facebook, Google, and us in the United States that reach over 200 million people. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of competition for subscription revenue to be that significant. But we hope it's, uh, it's meaningful. And again, it's not our primary focus, but it's a nice add-on for us. A nice add-on. I like the way you put that. Uh, one thing, though, that your company is struggling with is this 21 billion dollar cloud of debt that's kind of hanging over you. Revenue, although you say uh, you have plenty of it, has been relatively stagnant as well. I wonder, Bob, is iHeart a good company with, with a bad balance sheet? Is this something you can grow out of? Well, let me, let me talk to you about the revenue. Actually, if you look at the iHeart Media segment of our, our business, which is what we're talking about today, we've had 14 straight quarters of year-over-year -year revenue growth. I think there's probably not many traditional uh, uh, media companies can make the claim, and there are probably not many companies our size in the media business that can make that claim. So actually, the operating business has been doing very well uh, from a standpoint of transforming it from an old media company into a new media company uh, with digital plays, events, social, et cetera. And this company has always had a lot of debt. Uh, when I joined the company, it had already had this debt from the leverage buyout done in, uh, in, in the late 2007-2008 uh, period. So for us, we are, the first step always was, let's get the operating business transformed, which I think we're way underway and have seen evidence of the success. And uh, by the way, the broadcast audience is up, so we're not being hurt by digital. Our digital audience is up, so it's a nice add-on, and all these other pieces fit together. So I, I suspect when you got a company that's doing well, we'll figure out how to get the, the capital structure more normalized for a non-LBO company. Understood. Yet, I want to go back to the balance sheet here, because on the Bloomberg here, we have a function that allows you to see the debt distribution, and uh, this is DDIS for our terminal users. $21 billion in debt, almost $10 billion will have to be paid off in the next three years. There's a wall of debt coming due on 2019. How do you plan to address that before you hit the maturity wall head on? I wouldn't be the person to tell you exactly how we're going to do it, um, and uh, probably something I wouldn't talk about uh, uh, here, but uh, clearly I think it starts with having a company that's valuable and a, and a business that uh, that people want, and then it's a matter of, uh, as we have, uh, dealing with the conversations along.
That was iHeartMedia Chairman and CEO Bob Pittman. And as we wrap up the week that was in CES, Bloomberg Technologies Alex Webb has one more look at some of the wackiest gadgets he found on the showroom floor. So after a couple of exhausting days traipsing around CES in Las Vegas, I am now sitting in the latest product from Body Friend. They make a $5,000 massage chair. They're a pretty big deal in Korea. They sell 100,000 units a year there. Now they're looking to come to the US. All of my aching muscles are being massaged to within an inch of falling asleep. And that's pretty much what I'm ready to do. I think I maybe will. He gets all the fun. Bloomberg Technologies, Alex Webb reporting on the ground at CES. Lying back as well. And it's this edition of Out of This World. SpaceX is set to launch 10 satellites for Iridium Communications on Monday. This will mark the company's first flight since a Falcon 9 rocket blew up on the Florida launch pad in September. A smooth mission is critical for Iridium. Its shares plunged in the wake of the last accident and investor skepticism remains high. Short interest on the stock is at a record. In an interview, Iridium Iridium CEO said, well, the company's counting on SpaceX to take 70 new satellites into orbit in seven separate launches. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.
City. This is Charlie Rose. We begin this evening with a series of conversations examining the legacy of President Obama. In two weeks, he will leave the White House following eight historic years in office. Among his signature policy accomplishments were comprehensive health care reform and overhauling financial regulation in response to the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression.